Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I will now like to ask some of you to signal your intention to ask questions to Dr. Nike. The way in which we're going to do this is if you will signal your intention to me, we will then try and go up to the microphone on the podium in groups of five. Please stand at the podium, deliver your question, and wait at the podium until you have received your answer. Then return to your seat. So for the first five, can I get Ms. Goldberg, Mr. Bella? Please stand. Start off with those three queuing. And signal your intention and add to the queue after they come down. Dr. Knight, thank you very much for your talk. The question I have is you profess to be a man of peace. You've spoken very eloquently about the idea of peace and Islam. Peace is written in front of your microphone as you stand there. And I agree with you in, in many senses. But my question is why then is your message still seen as so controversial? Why are there figures within the Islamic world? Why are there fellow Islamic clerics who see your message and still believe that you are wrong? Why, I mean, you, you've claimed that the Home Secretary has banned you from this country because of a, a sort of media conspiracy, but why is there a broader sense of discontent with your message? The brother asked a very good question, that why if I'm a man of peace and I speak about peace, some people are against me, some Muslims, some non-Muslims, the Home Secretary. Brother, you have to understand that any person who's popular there are bound to be people who are against him, irrespective whether the popular person is doing good work or bad work. And the best example I can give you, that today, according to Michael H. Hart, he wrote a book saying, the 100 most influential people in the world history. Though he's a Christian, he put number one most influential human being as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Today, do you know? Though Muslims consider him to be the most important and the most influential person in history, there are many non-Muslims who think the same. But today, if we analyze the maximum books written against any human being on the face of the earth, it is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The second person he named in his list was Isaac Newton. But because he's not a common man for common human being, he's a scientist. The third person on his list was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If we analyze today, the second person in human history who has maximum books written against him, it is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Based on this argument, do I have to agree that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, they were not good? What we have to realize, when a person gets popular, there are bound to be people against him. And according to the Home Department of UK, when I had come in the year 2009, I was informed by reliable sources that according to the Home Department of UK, the most popular Islamic satellite channel in the world is Peace TV, and the most watched Islamic satellite channel in UK is also Peace TV. Not only is it watched by Muslims, but even watched by non-Muslims. The same report said that the most popular Islamic speaker in the world is Dr. Zakir Naik, and the most popular Islamic speaker in UK is also Dr. Naik. That's the reason the Home Department was requesting me that can I reach out to those Muslims which the UK government cannot. But now because of the change of government, what I feel, it was more of a political move rather than a legal move. And as maybe they wanted someone popular so that they could pass the message that we are tough against Muslims. And that's the reason what we feel that we have more faith in the judicial system rather than the political system. I think it was mainly because of popularity and it was mainly a political move rather than a legal move. And inshallah, God willing, we feel that this exclusion order would be reversed by the Court of Appeal, hopefully. Thank you. Fine. Uh, Milias Palaiwa is my name. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, a historian, and also a theologian. You gave a very excellent exposition of uh, the Quran and Islam, but uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all Abrahamic faiths. A Jew could have said the same thing, or this almost the same things if you said, by quoting uh, the Quran. Sorry, it's called quoting the the Torah and the Talmud, a Christian could have said almost everything you said by quoting both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I do not know whether we should be trying to say one religion 
is superior or more truthful than another. And if we do go down that line, what does that lead to? Uh, that's what led to the crusades, etc. You mentioned about justice and peace. Of course, the Christian Bible mentions more. There are more verses about justice and peace than there are about the Holy, Holy Spirit. And of course, Christians were pacifists until 313. When, uh, so what is the difference between what you are saying and Judaism and Christianity? And what would that lead to? But that's a very good question. And I do agree with him that if you read the books of Judaism, the books of Christianity, you will find verses of peace. Never in my lecture ever did I say that any religion is against peace or any religion is in favor of terrorism. I always said all religions are against terrorism. What I made one statement in my speech that the verse of the Quran, chapter 5, verse number 32, this verse, which is so emphatic, I do not find a similar verse in any other scripture because I'm a student of comparative religion saying that if you kill one innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you save one innocent human being, it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity. It was only one verse. So that generally, I do agree that most of the religions, almost all, they speak about peace. That's the reason Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you read the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 36, when he goes to the upper room, he says, when he wishes the apostles, Shalom Alaikum which means same, peace be upon you in Hebrew. So the greetings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him too, when he met the people was Shalom Alaikum, which meant same in Arabic, Assalamu Alaikum, may peace be on you. Regarding you saying that one religion is superior to the other religion, I believe Almighty God sent only one religion. He has not sent different religions. What the Quran says, he has made human beings into different tribes, different colors, different languages, so that they may recognize each other, not they may despise each other. The only religion that God has sent to all his messengers, whether it be Moses, whether it be Jesus, peace be upon him, Moses, peace be upon him, Muhammad, peace be upon him, it was to submit their will to Almighty God. I believe all these messengers, right from Adam, Noah, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, all of them brought the same message, that believe in one God and worship him alone and only him and submit your will to that almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Good afternoon, Dr. Naik. Um, my name is Izzy Westbury. I'm the secretary here at the Oxford Union. Uh, I have a very short question to ask. Um, you talk about the hijab being something that serves to protect a woman. Surely it's, it's extremely patronizing and degrading to prevent a woman from making that decision for herself. How could you answer that? What's the question, sister? I said, in your speech, you talk about the hijab being something that serves to protect a woman. But how is it not extremely patronizing and degrading in not allowing the woman to make that decision herself? Sister, I pose a very good question, that when I say that hijab is required for a woman, isn't it not degrading for the woman to patronize it? Isn't it degrading? If you read the Quran, the Quran and Islam has prescribed hijab. That means the woman should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. This is for the modesty. And it is not only mentioned in the Quran, it is also mentioned in the Bible. If you read the Bible in the first Timothy, chapter number two, verse number nine, it says that women should be dressed up with shamefacedness. They should be dressed up with sobriety and should not wear braided hair or gold or pearls. It's further mentioned in the first Corinthians, chapter number 11, verse number five, six. The woman that does not cover her head, then she dishonors her head. Her head should be shaved off. Anyway, I don't agree with this. I'm just quoting you from the Bible. Same way, if you go to the Vedas, it says that the woman should cover the head. So all the religious scriptures, they talk about the woman covering their head. It is for modesty. It is not to degrade the woman. And if you analyze, there was allegation made against me saying that Dr. Zakir Naik says that if they don't wear hijab, you know, that if you wear Western clothes, there are chances the women will be raped. It is a misquotation again. What I said that if women were revealing clothes, 
they have more chances of being raped. What I was doing, the same newspaper, Sunday Times, which spoke against me one year before, on the March of 9th, 2009, Sunday Times carried an article. In Britain, one out of seven feel that the women who were sexy revealing clothes, she should be hit. I'm sorry, I don't agree with it. This is the statistics that was given in the Sunday Times on the 9th of March 2009, that in Britain, one out of seven Britishers believe that the women who were revealing and sexy clothes should be hit. I disagree with this. Furthermore, one more article came in 2005 in the same newspaper Sunday Times. It said that 26% of the Britishers, they feel that wearing revealing clothes is partially or totally responsible for the rape. So what I say that the more modest you are dressed up, you are respected more. So Islam has prescribed the modest hijab for the woman not to degrade her but to uplift her. I do agree there may be cultural differences. Islam cannot force anyone to adopt it. There are cultural differences. For example, I'll give you an example. That some societies, what they feel, that even looking at a woman is immodest. Some societies feel looking is no problem, but touching a woman is immodest. Some of the societies feel shaking hand is no problem. Some societies feel kissing no problem. Some societies feel doing anything as long as both agree is no problem. Different societies and different cultures have got different rules and regulations. When I went to America, while I was giving a talk, one of the American told me, you Eastern woman, you are immodest. I was shocked. So I said, why do you call the Eastern woman immodest? He told me, you Eastern woman, you expose your belly. So in America and Western country, exposing belly is immodesty. In India, exposing belly is not immodesty, wearing shorts is immodesty. So what I've realized, sister, there's different culture, there's different system. Islam cannot force anyone to adopt. It's clearly mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256. Like Rafi there is no compulsion in religion. But if some women want to adopt the hijab because they feel modest and they feel respected, I feel no other woman should disagree. And when I've been to UK, I've seen hundreds and thousands of women who do cover their hair and who feel that they are uplifted because of this modesty. Hope that answers the question. Good evening, Dr. Zakir Naik. My name is Dr. Ramsey from Oxford, uh, Ambassador for Universal Peace Federation, and one of the members of the Muslim Council of Britain. I would like to say you are doing an excellent job. God bless you. <laughs> now my question, Dr. Zakir Naik, in your opinion, is Islamophobia a real phenomenon? And if so, how do you suggest it can be tackled? Does the responsibility lie with the Muslim community? Or should Western society be doing more to breach this barrier of fear? I'm talking about the fear, all phobias are fear, fear of unknown. Thank you. The brother asked a very good question, that is Islamophobia a real phenomena? How should it be tackled? Is it the responsibility of the Muslim community to do it? Yes, there is Islamophobia, especially in this 21st century. And as I mentioned in my speech, I believe one of the major reasons for this Islamophobia is the media. And I said in my speech that the media spreads several misconceptions about this religion of Islam. I do agree it is the duty of us Muslims that we should spread the true teachings of Islam. I'm aware that there are black sheep in the Muslim community. I'm not saying all Muslims are 100% pious, all are good. There are black sheep in every community, including Muslims. What does the media do? They pick up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray on the media as though they're exemplary Muslims. What we have to do is we have to portray the right teachings of Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And if any Muslim is involved 
in doing acts which are against the religion of Islam, which are acts of terrorism, killing of innocent human beings. It is the duty of us Muslims that we should tell such people it is haram. There are some people who are being misguided and they have been brainwashed into saying that killing innocent human beings is part of Islam. You will get reward. It's our duty as the mainstream Muslims to try and convey the right message of Islam and prevent such Muslims from being misguided. That's point number one. Point number two, it's our duty to tell the government of the country where you're living that Islam is a peaceful religion. And what I believe that Muslims should be part of the solution, they should not be part of the problem. The government should not think that Muslims are part of the problem, they should think Muslims are part of the solution. And that's the advice I even give to the police of India and the police of Bombay, and I interact with the police force very often. And I tell them that you should take the Muslims in confidence. And the best is to have an interaction. I have addressed many police officers from very different countries, and we should try and have a question and succession and remove the misconceptions in their minds and prove to them that Islam is one of the most tolerant religions. It's a peaceful religion. And if you know the teaching of Islam, surely the least person that you'll have to fear is a true Muslim. I'm not talking about the black sheep of the Muslim community. Hope that answers the question. Dr. Naik, I'm Yasmin. I'm a student at the university. And my question is sort of related to the last question. Um, you talked about you wanted to come to the UK because you wanted to reach out to Muslims who you felt that the government were not able to reach out to. And I wondered why, in your opinion, you felt that the government were failing in this way to reach out to Muslims in Britain. Thank you. This has a question that I wanted to come to UK to reach out to those Muslims who the government could not reach out. Sister, there's a slight confusion. I said, Charles Farr, the Director General of the Office of Security and Counterterrorism, felt that I could reach out to those Muslims who the government could not reach out to. He felt that, not me. And I think, again, because of the information which the Home Department has, that Peace TV is the most popular Islamic satellite channel in UK, watched by the Muslims as well as the non-Muslims, and the most popular speaker, according to the Home Department, not according to me, according to the Home Department, is Dr. Zakir Naik. So I repeated what he thought that I could reach better. Maybe he thinks that my speeches have influenced, and he may have read my speeches in context. That's the reason he was not in favor of the Home Secretary that she passed the exclusion order. Hope that answers the question. Do you think that he has a point? Do you think that, um, in some sense, the government are failing to reach out to Muslims in Britain? Yes. No. If you ask my opinion, that do I agree with the thoughts of Charles Farr that the government is failing out? Yes, I do agree with him. I do agree because, as I said in my earlier answer, that the government should not think that Muslims are part of the problem. The government should think that Muslims are part of the solution. Because a Muslim, there are many Muslims who are British citizens, and it is the duty of every Muslim to follow all the laws of the country staying in as long as the law does not force him to do something which is private in the religion or prevents him from doing something which is compulsory in religion. As far as India is concerned, I do not know of any rule or any law in the Constitution which forces a Muslim in India to do something which is prohibited. Neither does it prevent me from doing something which is compulsory. So I am a practicing Muslim and I'm proud to be an Indian. So I'm proud to be an Indian Muslim. Similarly, there are many Britishers who I feel may be feeling the same. They may be Muslims and they may be following the laws of the country, so they're British Muslims. So I feel that the government should take in confidence and what they should do, that they should see to it that this maligning by the media should stop. And the best example, best example is myself. I mean, there are many, there are 100 million viewers of Peace TV and there are millions of people who tell that I am the ambassador for peace. They say I'm a peaceful person. There are many heads of states of several foreign countries, many. They have called me at the state guest. So do you mean to say all these heads of states of several countries, 
the president, the prime minister, the king, the sheikh, they meet me, they have dinner. Do you mean to say they're meeting a person who is promoting terrorism? A person who spreads hate? So what I'm saying that this is all again manipulated by the media. So the government should not fall prey to the media and take any decision hastily. What they should do? They should give a chance for the person to clarify. And then I'm sure that most of the misconceptions will be removed. And I'm sure that UK would be a more peaceful country to live in. Hope that answers the question. for this evening due to the limitation of the satellite link. However, I would ask you now to join with me in thanking Dr. Knight for his speech and pass it back to Peace TV to finish the evening. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I remain James Langman and your president. Thank you. I would like to thank the Oxford Union, especially the president of the Oxford Union, Mr. James Langman, for making this event possible. And I really appreciate with the way they invited me for this talk. And at least now, the people of UK can really see a live telecast that I'm a person who gives the message of peace. In a live telecast, there is no editing. There is no manipulation. You can have more faith in these live telecasts rather than clippings from YouTube, which can be manipulated. I would like to thank the members of the Oxford Union once again, and I hope very shortly, once the exclusion order is reversed, I would like to personally come to the Oxford Union and meet the members of the Oxford Union. Thank you very much.